Hi everyone and welcome to this afternoon's webinar on the rivers and coasts of Iceland. Um, most of you know me by now, my name's Karen, I work for Discover the World Education, previously was a Geography Head of Department, Pastoral Deputy and then took a little bit of a career break from teaching um, and went out to Iceland to train as an Icelandic guide. I now work for Discover the World Education as one of their area managers and also one of their teacher tour leaders, um, which basically means I get to teach in the best classroom in the world um, and go out to Iceland several times a year um, with some of our school groups. Um, so today we are going to look at the rivers and coasts of Iceland. The aims of this particular webinar are to discover the different um, rivers and coastal formations, to look at the different fluvial and coastal formations and processes, how the Icelandic people use the rivers in Iceland, and really to discover that unique relationship between the geology and climate on the particular landscape in Iceland. Iceland as a case study is quite unique. It has a very um, sort of like interesting relationship between um, the climate, between the rock, um, between the landforms, and of course the tectonic processes. So it really enables your students and you to really think like geographers, to look at the relationships, to interlink those relationships, um, and just see what effect they have on each other. Iceland is an island that has a coastline of nearly 5,000 kilometres and coastal features caused by the destructive power of the waves are in abundance. And the geology of this volcanic landscape adds to the dramatic nature of the processes at play. The coastline is abundant with caves, cracks, arches, stacks, stumps, bays, dunes, bars and spits. And constructive and destructive waves attack the coastline, sometimes changing the landscape in just a matter of hours. I do remember guiding um, around about 15 years ago and being in the south coast of Iceland and taking one group and having to climb over some sand dunes to get to the beach down on Rainish Furphy Beach. I then went back the following week with another group and the sand dunes had disappeared. And it was all because of one particular storm. Um, so it really is quite dramatic changes that we will see in Iceland. Iceland really is a land of coastal extremes and fluvial geography is evident, evident at every turn. If there's one recurring theme to Iceland, it's the reliable presence of water, be it Iceland's heavy rainfall, the omnipresent Atlantic Ocean, the frozen and bejeweled glaciers, and the mystic lakes. Water is never ever in short supply. The average precipitation in Iceland sits at between 1,000 and 5,000 millimetres per year. In Reykjavik, which is in the southwest corner, they actually get between 800 and 1200 millimetres a year. But that's because sort of, you know, it, it's a lowland areas. Whereas in the highland regions, you can see here on the map that are famous um, shaded blue, that's where it gets between one and 5,000 millimetres a year. It's affected by the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic drift, um, and they get on average 215 days per year of either rain, snow or sleet. V-shaped valleys, meanders, braiding, deltas, waterfalls, gorges, all the different types of fluvial erosion and processes are clear to see. And the raw energy that occurs here is dramatic. And it's often unaffected and untouched by both economic development and population. So it makes Iceland the perfect location to enrich our knowledge and understanding of river processes and landforms. The water cycle in Iceland is about as eclectic, as enjoyable as a scientific process can get. If you don't like the weather in Iceland, wait 10 minutes. It's always changing. It's always changeable. And we always say to our groups that travel to Iceland, 
take a raincoat. That is the most important thing that you can take because it is likely that within the time that you spend in Iceland, it is going to rain. And whether the water is frozen into intricate ice sculptures cascading over the lip of Detifoss or simply pummeling down from the heavens, Iceland is geographical processes in action. The vast majority of rivers in Iceland originate from the country's glaciers. And for centuries, the runoff has carved itself through the young, geologically speaking, landscapes, sculpturing valleys, cliff sides and mountain ridges on its journey towards the Atlantic. Iceland's river systems are an opportunity to see fluvial processes and offer a deep insight into both the country's natural history and also its geological future. As is often the case with island societies, it is considered unlikely that the rivers were used for navigation by Iceland's early inhabitants. The Norsemen would have found the rivers either too short for long distance travel or simply too hazardous, flowing dangerously into rapids and waterfalls. This is only strengthened with the foreknowledge of the river's origins in the treacherous Icelandic highlands. And you can see the, here this historic map showing the highlands in the central areas as well as the glaciated areas. You can also see there from this historic map, which goes back thousands of years, you know, the treacherous volcanoes that were also in the central part of the highlands. However, rivers still make an appearance in the Icelandic Book of Settlements. They were important for orientation, a source of food, and fishing was, and still considered, a necessary skill for survival. The remote location of Iceland make it incredibly important to ensure a reliable source of food, and fish is a staple part of the Icelandic diet. It was then, and it really is now. And Iceland's rivers are teeming with fish, including Arctic char, Atlantic salmon, and trout. Iceland has hundreds of rivers of varying sizes. And today we're going to just focus on a couple which provide us with the best examples of processes and landforms. The Thorsal River is Iceland's longest and second most voluminous river, and it is found in the south of Iceland. It originates from the glacier Hofsjökull. This river is around 230 kilometers long and can be translated as the river of the bulls. It passes through narrow crags of the highlands and the river flow is strengthened by another river called Tungnau, which joins it downstream in the lowlands. Thjorsau has created through vertical erosion the staggeringly beautiful Thorsadala Valley before flowing through a series of lava fields and ending up towards the South Atlantic Ocean here in the south of Iceland, North Atlantic Ocean, but the south of Iceland with this beautiful de delta with fabulous braiding. The Thjorsau is an important source of energy for the Icelandic people, and there are five power stations situated along the river. As we know from my previous webinar on energy, hydroelectric power is an important part of the production of energy for Iceland. The population, the economy and the environment all are affected by this hydroelectric power and 73% of the total power in Iceland comes from hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power can be controversial and there are future plans to build another three more power stations along the lowland stretch of the Thjorsau River. One of these sites is Eurydifoss, pictured here on the right hand side, top and bottom picture. It's an interesting topic for a decision-making exercise. We can look at the advantages and the disadvantages of this area, both in terms of the people and the economy, and also in terms of the environment and the landforms. This really allows students to think like geographers about looking at what's here, what they're planning, and what could be the sort of the considerations for that in the future. 
On the left hand side here, I have put a picture of a hydroelectric power station on the Thiorsal Valley, together with some of the channels that have been made further upstream to allow the water to flow more freely from the dammed area. So, as I said, hydroelectric power, it can be controversial, um, but it is a major, major part of the economy um, provision and the environmental impact on the Icelanders. The Jokulsal Alfjörlum is a mighty river that flows from the glacier of Vatniurkul. Jokulsal Alfjörlum translates to the glacial mountain river and it is celebrated as Iceland's second largest river and is the source of many waterfalls and cascades including Detifoss, Europe's most powerful waterfall. The water flowing through Detifoss is on average 193 cubic metres per second. That's immense. And this picture that I've put here, you can see the scale of this waterfall against the people standing quite close to the edge of the gorge, I have to say. But this waterfall is just incredible. It's within the lava fields. You can't hear it or see it. And then you walk up and you have this thunderous noise where this tremendous amount of water is flowing down from the Vatniurkel Glacier into this particular gorge. As I said, 193 cubic meters per second. This particular waterfall sits at around about 100 meters wide and only plummets down 45 meters in the Jokulsal Fjord Canyon. Along this canyon, there are also two other big waterfalls, Selfoss and Hagfiltfoss. The water is often clouded gray. This shows the sediment which has been collected from the eroded lava, eroded lava fields and the glaciers. And also, if they have had an eruption in previous years, this can also contain the ash from those particular eruptions. Now, new research from Edinburgh University has revealed that this particular waterfall, Detifoss, was actually created over just a matter of days by extreme flooding from a glacier due to a volcanic eruption. Now, our textbooks and our studies generally advise us that actually natural environments are formed over thousands of years, and usually they are. But very rarely you have this event that can shape the landscape incredibly suddenly. The canyon, which is around about 28 kilometers long, and as we said, 100 meters deep, was formed by a series of just three floods that occurred 9,000, 5,000 and 2,000 years ago. And all these floods were caused by volcanic activity under the glaciers each powerful enough, enough to tear up the bedrock, forming the canyon's 100 meter walls and pushing these three waterfalls, including Detifoss, back upstream by as much as two kilometers during each flood. These findings demonstrate the long-term impact that extreme flood events, particularly when they involve volcanic action under glaciers called Jerklaups, can have on the landscapes. And these floods were triggered by eruptions beneath Vatniurkel, which is the largest ice cap in Iceland and in Europe. One of these volcanoes, Bardabunga, actually erupted as recently in August in 2014, and it is still quite considerably active now. It's certainly one of the volcanoes that actually is on a heightened awareness as being quite possibly to erupt in the very near future. The largest glacial flood was in the Holocene period and the subsequent discharge was thought to be at 900,000 cubic meters per second. Now, just to put this in comparison, the Amazon River has a discharge of just one fifth of this. So we are talking about a flood event that was five times the discharge of the Amazon River. So the relationship between Iceland's volcanoes and the river systems is clearly indicative of the landscape's current form. 
The Kuitau River is the White River and it is one of the most beautiful rivers in Iceland. The river source is the Lang Jökull Glacier in the Highlands, particularly the Kuivatn Glacial Lake, which you can see here on the image of the left. This particular river flows 185 kilometres south towards the Atlantic Ocean. And Kuitau actually begins with a 40 kilometre journey to Gullfoss, which is quite possibly the most famous waterfall in Iceland. At Gullfoss, it drops into a narrow gorge, which was originally a crack in the dried lava fissure. Gullfoss cascades 32 metres down into a series of several cascades and the canyon walls reach heights of up to 70 metres. And again, geologists believe that this canyon was also formed by glacial outbursts at the beginning of the last ice age. In the summer months, obviously the water is much more voluminous and approximately 140 cubic metres surge down the falls every day. There is a fine balance in Iceland between development in the economy and environmental conservation. And sustainable development has been at the forefront of the Icelandic's future and political planning. The environmental movement has arguably, arguably been a part of Icelandic society since as early as 1907. And the iconic Gullfoss waterfall was subject to an ownership battle with a British, British businessman called Hal, who proposed to the Gullfoss's then owner, Thomas Thomason, that he would buy the falls and utilise its raw power by constructing a hydroelectric power dam. Now, you can imagine what that would have done to this particular landscape here. It would have changed it, you know, just incredibly and quite dramatically. Now, for many years after 1907, Thomas's daughter, Sigrid, was entangled in a legal battle in order to save the falls and to stop the development. And many times she walked on her own to Reykjavik across the lava fields, some 120 kilometres, in order to ensure that her voice was heard. I think similarities can be drawn here to another young lady whose actions have sparked the interest around the globe in terms of environmental protection and conservation. The size of the canyon in Gullfoss are a chronological picture um, of the geology of this particular area. You can see evidence here. I'm just going to try and point it out of the different layers of rock showing the historic lava flows, the sedimentary rock, the basalt columns you can just see here through the spray. And if I move on to the next slide, you can actually see here the different sort of like um, lava flows quite significantly. I know this is a slightly filtered image, which isn't my favourite image, but in terms of the rock formation, you can see here. Um, the nice flowing lava here and the much more blocky, chunky lava here. So the waterfalls and the rivers in the south of Iceland have a very different feel to the raw power of those in the north. We looked earlier at Detifoss, which is a tremendous waterfall with huge volumes and discharge of water. Gullfoss is quite a strong waterfall, okay, but nothing like Detifoss. And if we move further south, Saljansfoss is a waterfall which is fled by the, fed by the glacier of the infamous Eyjafjallajökull, Jökull. And the groundwater flow from that particular glacier and the meltwater flows across the natural flat heathland on the highlands before plunging 60 metres over this volcanic cliff. This cliff was once part of the coastline of Iceland before post-glacial rebound. An isostatic rebound occurred in this area and the isostatic depression and this post-glacial rebound, which are the phases of glacial isostasy, when the Earth's crust responds in changes to the weight of the ice, has made these landforms all the way along this particular coastline. I say coastline, it's now six kilometres inland, but obviously it was, it was a coastline. As the glaciers are melting, the weight is reduced, the land continues to rise, and Iceland is still finding its equilibrium. It's still finding its balance. 
Behind this waterfall, you can see evidence of geology showing historic marine sediments that previously were part of the ocean floor. It's always great to take the kids here to try and find the fossils and the shells because it really is sort of like seeing things and discovering things for themselves. And I don't tell them the story as to what this cliff was previously. We then talk about it afterwards. You know, what have you found? What could possibly have happened? Now with Salyandifos, its structure is a typical textbook waterfall. It has an overhang, it has an undercut, it has a plunge pool, but its origins are not traditionally waterfall textbook. And again, this shows the clear relationship between Iceland's volcanoes, glaciers and river systems. I want to briefly look at a waterfall that is quite unique and quite special. It's actually one of my favourite waterfalls in Iceland. It's called Hrunafoss. And these waterfalls are um, located in a fantastic lava field near Borgarnes in the western part of Iceland. And these stunning falls run in a cascade series down a lava cliff of around 900 metres wide. The water originates from the Langjökull glacier, but rather than following the course of the river, the water flows underground through the layers in the lava bedrock before reappearing at the falls at Hrunafoss and actually joining the Kuitau River. So the same river that Golfoss runs on, this particular waterfall runs on this. Hrunafoss is aptly named. Hrun means lava and fossa means falls. So these are the lava falls. It's another stunning example highlighting the unique relationship between volcanoes, glaciers and fluvial landscapes and landforms. Now the rivers in the lower course of Iceland are not so common. Obviously geologically it's very new so therefore the landscapes are quite raw and the glaciers are creating ever-changing landscapes which means rivers very easily change their course. But we do have evidence here of meanders. You've got the river cliff, cliff and you've got the beaches and you can actually see sort of like the rapids forming. But they're not quite so common. However, braided rivers are quite common, particularly in the south of Iceland, where you've got these glacial rivers coming down, entering that um, rebounded landscape and the water starts to slow down. So there is a buildup of sediment in the river. The glacial sediment builds up to form a delta and the patterns of the braiding will change over time. And one of the most dramatic areas for braiding is on the Thorsal glaciated river delta in the south of Iceland. The colours of the glacial sediment tell a real story as to where both this glacier and river have journeyed. The rhyolite mountains in the highlands, which are pink, yellow and orange, and the volcanic black ash and the blue coppery tones are all highlighted in the most spectacular formations. I think actually what the, the braiding of this river is perhaps one of the most dramatic features that, that we actually do see in Iceland. It is stunning and it changes all the time. The colours change depending on the light, um, depending on whether it is I icy or snowy um, or whether there has been lots of meltwater. It really is quite a dramatic ever-evolving formation. So as we know Iceland is the second largest island in Europe. It's the 18th largest island in the world and I said right at the beginning that the coastline is around about 5,000 kilometres long. It's actually 4,970 kilometres long so it's pretty close and the dramatic nature of the geology lends itself to the most wonderful coastal features and processes. Iceland has an incredibly rugged coastline and bays, headlands and fields are evident wherever you go. The most spectacular black sand beach in Iceland, I think, is Reynisfjöra. And this site was named after a Norwegian Viking called Reina. And he was the first settler in this area. Reynisfjöra translate as Reina's beach. Reynisfjöra is Reina's mountain. And Reynisdranger are the pillars that you can see and can also be found here. 
Aside from the enchanting pitch black coast dotted with pebbles and stones caused by the erosional power of the waves, this area also has enormous basalt stacks, hexagonal shaped basalt columns, stunning lava formations, towering cliffs and basalt caves. The Atlantic Ocean is in full power in this area with the waves crashing into this bay and the relationship between volcanoes and Iceland's coastal features and landforms is really very evident here. Rainish Fiera is located at the base of the historic and very famous and deadly Katla volcano. And this has erupted violently several times over the last thousand years. And this beach was actually formed during one of these eruptions. And we know from my previous work on um, looking at volcanoes and webinars and that sort of stuff, that actually Katla is due to erupt after A of fleckley yerkel erupts and it is long overdue. The black sand beaches arise from the volcanic ashes where molten lava enters the water and a violent interaction occurs between the hot lava and the seawater. The lava cools down so rapidly that it breaks into debris and sand instantly. And a huge amount of lava flow entering the ice cold sea may produce enough fragments to create a new black sand beach. The columnar joints that you can see here on the right hand side are called gather and they are a striking landform to the east of this particular beach and these fractured cliffs are formed when molten rock basalt cools very quickly and as the rock contracts from the edge symmetrical geological shapes are formed. Rainer's pillars are the stacks which sit just to the south of the beach. These basalt sea stacks were part of Rainer's Fuel Mountain and they were separated from the mainland as a result of coastal erosion and attack from the destructive Atlantic waves. Of course, Icelandic folklore has a number of stories and explanations as to how these stacks actually came to be. And one such story claims that there were two giant trolls towing their boats to shore who turned to stone when they were suddenly caught in the sun at dawn. Another story holds that they are actually the remains of two trolls who kidnapped a local wife and were then turned to stone by her vengeful husband. However, as geographers, we obviously know that this was part of a headland and the waves have attacked the headline, headland at the weak spot, causing a crack, a cave, an arch, a stack, and then they're turning into stumps. Now the power of the sea is very, very evident in this particular area. And if you were to go south, due south, the next place that you would reach would be Antarctica. So therefore these waves are quite erratic and quite dramatic, unpredictable. The fetch can be absolutely huge and so can the orbit of the waves. Also, you get incredibly strong winds. If you've ever been to Iceland, it's generally windy a lot of the time. And down on the south here, they do consider it's one of the windiest places in Iceland. Just off the coach of this coast of this beach here that we can see around about five kilometers, there is actually quite a deep shelf and the waves therefore really gain power. You can see some pictures here of some of the waves. They are unpredictable. They can be extremely large and powerful and they do, these aren't them, but they do always as well, a couple of times a year, suffer from sneak waves. And these are large waves that strike without warning. They sometimes claim the lives of the unwary due to their unpredictability. And several tourists over the last few years who have failed to heed the warnings and actually respect the nature have unfortunately lost their lives. And you do sometimes see people very, very close to the sea, and they really are underestimating the power that these particular waves and coastline can have. I always go down to these beach with my guiding groups and actually with my family. It is the most stunningly beautiful beach, but you do have to respect the nature. You have to respect the power and heed the warnings that are there for you. 
Along the coastline to the west of Vic is the island of Diralay, a spectacular promontory. And Diralay is of volcanic origin and formed late during the last ice age. It happened in an underwater eruption, very similar to the one that took place when the island of Circe formed in 1963. It's believed to be around about 100,000 years old. And the island shows slightly different geologies with basalt and tuft. Now, as in most, it is the most southerly point in Iceland, and it is now connected to the mainland with a shingle causeway due to the isostatic rebound. There's a dramatic arch, which is obviously being created by the power of the waves. And this is what gives name to this area because Diralay itself means hole in the door. You will notice that all the Icelandic names of all the landforms and um, the towns and the cities, they all have some sort of meaning. For example, Reykjavik means smoky bay. Okay, Diralay, the hole in the door. Eyjafjallajökull, the fire mountain glacier. Okay, so all of the names of the rivers and the mountains and the landforms and the towns and everything are all named very logically after what they are predicting. You wouldn't often see golden beaches in Iceland and Skarsvik Beach in the west is something of a geological phenomenon. A shelf some 10 to 20 kilometres offshore has created broken seashells, which are then deposited in this beautiful bay area here. So prior to that, this actually was a black beach. And you can see evidence of this by the little lava bedrock and stones that are actually popping themselves out there of the nice sand beach. And this is really a beautiful beach. Um, but again, quite different to the beaches that you would normally see in Iceland. There are many dramatic headlands, cliffs, arches, stacks and caves around the Icelandic coastline with the occasional stunning beach areas. Let's move on now and look at the fjords in Iceland. Now there are mainly, there are 109 actually fjords in Iceland. Um, they're mainly divided between the east of Iceland and the western fields. Now, a field is a U-shaped inlet of land. It's carved out or formed by a glacier tongue. And typically, they are long, deep and narrow and become flooded by seawater as the glacier retreats back away from the sea. All Icelandic fields are connected to the ocean. The myriad of fields in the volcanic island offer breathtaking scenery, as you can see from these images here, with impressive mountains on each side. And many of these mountains are actually dotted with waterfalls due to the groundwater flow that is coming between the layers of rock. And you can see here, you can see that the water is going over the top of the lava, flowing and cascading down, and then sometimes coming out of the faults in the bedrock as well. The Whale Fjord, Halfjordor, is a fjord in southwest Iceland, and the fjord is approximately 30 kilometres long and five kilometres wide. Historically, this field is of significant importance, both strategically and geologically. The origin of the name Hjalfjordor, which means whale field, is uncertain. There is no presence of whales in the field. And whilst there is a historic whaling station in the field, whaling was actually conducted in the ocean. Whaling has not been a part of the Icelandic culture and economy for a few years now, which is great to hear. Um, and one theory that there was at one point a pod of whales that was stranded in the field. And another is that it was named after Hjalfjall, the whale mountain. Um, so maybe after its visual appearance. Of course, as we know, the Icelandics love their folklore. And according to Icelandic folk tales, the field was actually named after an angry red-headed whale that was trapped in the field. 
Apparently, an elf woman had transformed her human lover into an angry whale as revenge for refusing to acknowledge their child. During World War II, a naval base um, of the British and American navies could be found on this field, and there's still evidence of this particular naval base here now. The fields in Iceland are again real evidence of the relationship between volcanoes, ice and landforms. Each field shows a cross section of the past. You can see from this particular picture the layers of the lava flows over the year and they are a clear reminder that this unique geology and tectonic formation actually creates the most stunning landforms. If you want to see or learn more about some of the incredible landscapes in Iceland, I would really recommend that you take a look at our interactive GIS map. Now, this map is really, really easy to navigate around. It's really easy to use. There are just over 40 short videos on here. They're very short, less than 20 seconds per video. And um, my colleagues have gone around there with drones and um, videos and still images to actually give you a taster as to what a lot of the sites and landforms are like in Iceland. It's great as a starter or as a finishing activity or to use as an example if you're explaining something about Iceland. And I think the waterfalls, the rivers and the coastlines are really depicted very, very well within this particular resource that you can use. It's also a great activity for kids to use sort of like at home just to explore what this island can actually offer in terms of looking at sort of like case study material. You can see there how it is on our website. All you have to do, go onto our website, click on launch GIS Iceland to get started. You then move around the areas that you are particularly interested in. You click on the thumbnail that's on the top there, the number, whichever one you want to go, and then the video will launch. Some of them has um, sort of like auditory stuff going on with um, my colleagues explaining what's happening. They've all got bullet point information um, and little sort of like banners that come in to give you some of the keywords the key terminology about that particular area. So a really good educational resource. Okay, this is our last um, of our series three webinars. We're going to take a short break over the summer now. I do hope that you've really enjoy, enjoyed learning about the many different topics that we've covered as well as the one today. All our webinars are available on our website. All you have to do is, is click through and you just view now. You don't have to sign up or anything like that. They are all available. And then if you wanted to share some of these webinars, which are particularly useful and invaluable for your students, for example, the resource management um, ones, they're very much focused on the GCSE specifications. Um, that's why we've done it. So they are a good revision topic. Um, or as an enrichment or enhancement activity. And they are completely student friendly as well, encouraging students to just really think like geographers um, and, and really implement some of the critical thinking strategies. There's also on there a couple of virtual trips. There's one to Iceland, um, which I did at the beginning of um, lockdown really, just to cover really those um, students who had their trip postponed. And then there's a brand new resource on there, which is really looking at Norway um, from both a pastoral and a geographical opportunity um, and some quite interesting thoughts on that. We will, we will be um, launching a brand new exciting lesson series in the autumn. So please do keep an, an eye out for our information on this. And in the meantime, I hope you have a really, really wonderful summer break and I look forward to talking with you all again um, in the new term. Take care everyone and stay safe. Thank you.